Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am Princess Redwood Flowers, the youngest daughter of Chief Lumpea of the Sherwood Valley Band of Homo Indians. And my father's name is Lou Mulcahy, if any of you remember him. This is the land acknowledgement part of the program from the Mendocino Women's Political Coalition. We wish to honor the homeland that we are on here, the First Nations people in this area, Mendocino County. We want to offer recognition and respect to counter the degree of discovery with the true story of the original people who were raised here, and to support the reconciliation efforts, reconciliation efforts rather. The Mendocino County Women's Political Caucus acknowledges that the land where we live and work and play is unceded territory of the First Nations tribal peoples since time began. We are surrounded by this traditional ancestral territory and we must strive to understand their cultural values. And I say to Willis, this is the start of becoming a community of unity. Thank you so much. Before we go any further, I want to make sure to thank people involved in putting this on today. Liam uh, is responsible for the sound uh, here in Grange and opened up this building for us to get in and set it all up. So thank you for being here. And way in the back, Tim is is doing the Zoom portion of this forum. So thank you, Tim, for doing that. <laughs> and I also want to thank other members involved in the organization of today. Uh, Matt Strong. Thank you. <laughs> Helen Diamond. <laughs> Judy Burgess. Somewhat tangentially, Val Muchowski. I don't want to put your name. Val. You told me your name, and I just Jane. 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 Thank you. Jane has been our timer today. It was suggested to me we flip a coin to see who goes first. Liam, will you be our coin flipper? Sure. <laughs> okay. I won't get it um, John, heads or tails? Heads. I think I'm going to go for tails. <laughs> <laughs> oh, looks like John goes first. Okay. Three minutes opening statement, and then for prepared questions, you will each have two minutes to respond. We will alternate who goes first with the responses to the prepared questions. All right, well, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm John Haschek, supervisor for the third district and running for re-election. Um, I moved to Willits in 1969. My mother moved us here with my two brothers and sister, the four of us um, kids. I started in fifth grade in Willits and uh, went through the public schools. And then I taught in the Willits schools for 30 years and um, ran for for supervisor last time four years ago um, and some of the key issues that were happening were you know um, good government the economy and safe communities and every day since then i've been working on those three issues um, when I got into office, you know, well, when I was running, one of the key issues was that the supervisors had given themselves an almost 40% raise, and the workers didn't get anything. And so I, um, I said I wasn't going to take that money, and that I would. And so what I did was I created a scholarship for students who were going into public service in the communities of Willits, Laytonville, and Cobolo. Since that time, I've given $27,000 in scholarships to those students. I'm very proud of 
proud of that. Um, and, and so I've been working for the last three and a half years on the, the transparency in the county, the accessibility for people to be in touch with their supervisor, and um, accountability. And I think that um, I've done a great job, but it's not just me, it's people helping me do that job. It's Matt Strong and Well, you know, helping, one minute left, <laughs> you know, helping us, helping do the town halls that keep people informed. It's um, the newspapers publishing my monthly updates. It's the, it's the different groups, the Sherwood Firewise, that helps put on um, these great events that keep the communities safe. It's a well that's put on town halls for um, fire, are you ready? You know, all of these people have come together during this time and have created you know, some of the things that I've been working on about safe communities, about a, a stronger economy, and about um, accessibility and good government. And so I really want to appreciate the people of Mendocino County and especially the third district for helping me do my job. Hello everybody, I'm Clay Romero. I've been in this area for about uh, 48 years. I actually graduated from Lakenville High School in 1978. Uh, I, I moved to Brook Trails in 1979 and for the most part I've been here the whole time. It's, uh, it's very nice to see you all. You know, I'm, I'm thinking that the ballots already just came out. It, how many of you already voted? Oh, I think I still have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I think you'll find that I'm, I'm primarily a machinist in this, this day and age. Uh, typically, uh, you would not see me a whole lot because I'm inside of a a building all the time, but this does not mean I'm not listening. Uh, I listen very, very carefully, actually. Uh, you'll find me, I'm, I'm principally a, probably a problem solver rather than a politician or a bureaucrat, and I, I try to look for things that, that can be improved upon. This is what I do on a regular basis with, with what I do, and I do looking forward to seeing if I could work with the other supervisors in that regard. I, I think you'll find that uh, I, I'm probably the, 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 the one guy that's very much uh, critical of the government mandated uh, lockdowns that came about from the COVID virus. Uh, I can well understand uh, shutting down a country or an area for uh, say two weeks or maybe a month. But after that, you're not controlling a virus, you're controlling people. I find that deeply offensive. That's part of something that uh, rather got, got me going on this too. I'm also mindful of the amount of homeless people that go down my street on Shell Lane. I know they're leaving a, an enormous mess uh, near the bypass. And it's something I'm, I'm looking into and very concerned about. There's, for the most part, there's a lot of uh, uh, drug addiction and, and alcoholism that leads to this. And, uh, that seems to be the bulk of the, the problem with, with the folk here. Uh, there is some mental illness that has to be dealt with differently, but, but I really should emphasize that everybody that's homeless, there's, there's different reasons for it. For some, it's, and most of it, is, is the people with, with the addic an addiction problem. But I also know that there's other people, like mom and dad and two kids, where the mom had, say, uh, cancer and the father had a heart attack. And even though they were fully insured, the co-pays ate them up and they ended up losing their home. So, you know, these are, these are things that I, I think about and I'm very, very mindful of and want to do what I can to be helpful in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. From here on uh, going forward, we will have prepared questions. And Mr. Romero, if you would be kind enough to be the first responder. Many people believe that our drought will be continuing. What is your vision to ensure adequate, available water for residents of Mendocino County? 
Well, I, I do know that uh, a, a significant amount of the water that's that, that, that's available is, is out at Lake Pillsbury. Uh, I would be in favor of lazy, raising Scott Dam to see if we can capture more of that water. Uh, there is actually a, uh, a funds available for doing that that would be available by way of a grant to access the water bond uh, of 2014 specifically for, the, for that purpose. Uh, I think that would probably our best, be our best bet, we, but we do need to be prepared with what we have to have uh, other areas that would be available uh, for uh, lakes and, and reservoirs to help us get, get past this time of drought. I know that the rains will come again, I'm pretty clear on that, but uh, we, 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 we can't wait around for too long, otherwise we go thirsty along with a lot of other plants and animals. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I think I differ from Mr. Romero in thinking that we're going to be out of this because I think this is part of climate change. We're in this increased aridity. You know, the summers are longer, the summers are hotter. We don't, we aren't getting the water that we had when I was a kid around here. Um, so, you know, I can't say that the water is coming back. So we need to prepare for that. I've been on the um, drought task force with Supervisor McGordy for the past year, and we've been working every day on it. Um, we've gotten $23.3 million from state grants and funds from the state water board coming into Mendocino County for water storage, for inner tie systems between different water agencies, and um, just lots of projects because what we haven't had in Mendocino County, besides the Ukiah Basin, which is a groundwater um, special area, we haven't had the knowledge of what we have in our aquifers and the quality of that water. And so we really need to work on getting grants to, to get that kind of knowledge you know, about the quality, the quantity of the water that we're dealing with, especially in Cobolo, Lakeville, Willits. Um, another issue I've been working on is, is the extraction of the water. And we've had issues in the Willits Little Lake Valley where people, even the city, are extracting water and then it's being hauled off in water trucks into the hills. It's causing damage to our bridges, our roads, and um, a lot of times these are illegal cannabis grows. And so we're trying to figure out how we can regulate that for the people of Mendocino County because we can't go on extracting water without knowing what is sustainable for that watershed. And so those are a couple issues that I've been working on. And so, and also we need, you know, I was just reading in the CNN this morning about um, California. And we're doing a great job on the North Coast about conservation of water. Southern California is doing a really poor job on it, but we need to we need to do better than what we've been doing, even because we don't know when this water is coming back. So thank you. Thank you. Next question um, to be answered first by Mr. Hostin. How do you see the best way to address the huge deficit? in the health plan fund for county workers. Yeah, we just found out about the, the deficit in the health county plan for, um, that it's about $4 million. And we didn't know about it. It's been ongoing for the last couple of years. And so, so what we're looking at is using the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act money to cover that deficit that we've had. Going forward, you know, we need to, um, you know, health, health benefits are rising. And with COVID and the pandemic, we've seen a real increase in people getting really sick and the cost of that. And so that's been a, a burden on the county. And um, we need to figure out how to properly fund it. We're looking at some other providers because right now the county is self-funded for their program. But you know what I don't want to do is put it on the backs of the workers because um, this is health, healthcare should be a right 
and it should be something that ha everyone has access to. We've got people who work in healthcare, just like where I came from in education. You know, people depend on that healthcare. You you work in these jobs. You don't get paid much money. I never got paid much as a teacher, but at least you have health benefits. And for the county workers, I want to see them and have health benefits. And I think everyone in our country should have health benefits that uh, take care of us in times of need, so we don't end up homeless and bankrupt and all that. So I think uh, Mr. Romero and I agree on that we should have health care so people don't end up homeless, right? I would say so, yes. <laughs> as far as health care goes, uh, interestingly, it's, it's, it's been a, a few years ago, but I actually uh, uh, studied health care funding uh, extensively and ultimately designed a health care funding system for the United States. It's something I, I have a bit of an idea on. I know, generally speaking, if there's an insurance company involved in it, it's probably going to be one strike against you because insurance companies are always going to be more of a holden to their shareholders than uh, the patients that hopefully we would like to serve. Uh, so what, what I've found in all of this is that, well, you, the thing I, I do did discover, and, and maybe some of you will find this uh, disagreeable, but yeah, healthcare is actually not a right. And the reason I say that is because things that are, are rights typically do not involve money. In this, in this case, it actually does because when you have a doctor, if someone has, if we were to have, say, a, 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 a right, a right to healthcare, that means that uh, law enforcement authorities would have a good reason to take a doctor or perhaps a nurse or other healthcare provider and against their will at any hour or time to help someone out. That's, that's what it means when you have a right. So I, I don't see that as actually being, being valid. Uh, I would like to see that healthcare is certainly well available uh, for anybody that would like to get that. I think it's extremely important. Uh, the particular system that I came up with is where everybody were to pay a certain amount of money each month. And it's very, very important that healthcare providers are always paid up front and not through an intermediator. Inter intermediary. Uh, generally speaking, when you have an inter intermediary paying your healthcare, uh, they start calling the shots as to how, uh, what or what kind of healthcare and how much you can receive. So it's it's a very testy situation now. But the system I came up with is basically like a, a medical health care plan, similar to like if you were to go to a, a health club where you can work out on the Stairmaster. If you can uh, uh, pay so much a month to get your medical health care, it gets paid directly and it's far, far more effective in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, what is your position on closing the Mendocino County Museum in Willis? You know, there's perhaps other things that, 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 that could be done there, but the Mendocino County Museum, I really like. I would hate to see that closed, so I, I think if it were up to me, I, I, would, I would probably, I'm, I'm sure I would keep it open. Yeah, thank you. Well, there's an operational um, gap in our funding for the, the county right now. And so it was proposed by another supervisor at the last meeting um, that we could cut the museum and it would save $555,000. Well, I spoke up against that at the time because I've been working with the staff at the museum. We've been, um, we've been making great progress over the last year on a strategic plan you know we've got and so this is what we envision for the future of the museum and this is right getting getting the whole collection in order and also how to greater outreach into the community how to represent all the communities of our county and all the geographic areas but also 
you know, this is the history of our county. Um, so working with the staff at the museum, I had a meeting with them Wednesday, and then working with the fiscal department, it turns out that the savings for closing the doors of the museum would be something around $100,000. And that would mean because you've still got to keep the collections going and everything. Um, and so to cut the, the momentum that we have in the museum at this point would be devastating. And we all know that the museum is integral for Willits because it's connected to the art center, it's connected to the library, it's connected to Roots of Motive Power. We have all these organizations that are doing great work and we cannot close the museum now. Since Sonoma County got contracted to deal with wildlife issues in Mendocino County, we have had no service. What do you propose to take care of diseased wildlife that threaten our pets, livestock, and residents? Well, I think the, the question is a little misguided, but I will explain what's happened, and I think the intent of the question is asking what about wildlife services in Mendocino County, what happened to it, all of that. What are we going to do as the future for this issue about how to deal with animals that are rabid or any kind of wildlife confrontation conflict with humans. So what happened was we did have a wildlife services contract with the USDA. And that was very controversial. And in the end, it turned out that wildlife services, which would trap animals, which would kill them, because that was their the way they dealt with them, that um, they had actually quit serving Mendocino County before we cut their contract. Okay? And we just found out that a few months when we went to cut the contract, they said, we stopped serving you already. But in the, in the meantime, I've worked with a great group of people. We worked with Project Coyote, a woman with a doctor who is a head of carnivore person for Project Coyote. We worked with the Farm Bureau, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, Ag Department, to create a program. And we're going to present it on June 8th. And that program is going to be about, we've got a, a a person on contract will start on June or July 1st who will deal with all the small animals. If a skunk gets under your house, if a raccoon is eating your dog food or whatever, you know, those kind of wildlife conflict issues, she'll be able to deal with. And then we're also working with the program to educate people, to provide funding for um, small projects, and it will also um, it will educate farmers and ranchers in how to better deal with wildlife conflict. And so we're rolling that out on June 8th, and it's been great collaboration from many different groups and perspectives on this issue. I think the service we will provide will be better than it was before, and a lot cheaper. Well, in thinking back, when I, when I first moved to Laytonville, my next door neighbor was Sully Pinches, who was an animal control officer. And he dealt with all kinds of things very, very quickly. Uh, I'm, I don't know what the current state of it is. I can't imagine it would be very, very expensive. Uh, but the, uh, it, it ranged anywhere from uh, simple you know, catching and relocating to, to where you, you have, to, have to put the animal to death immediately before any very serious matters occur. And this was all handled at that time. Now, why this is stopped or why it was transferred to Sonoma County for, for their, uh, for their uh, under their contract for Mendocino County, it seems a little odd. So, but uh, I, I would certainly like to see at least, you know, one or two animal control officers within this county to, to attend to that. And this is not, not an expensive thing to do. So, Anyway, that's that's about all I have for you. Thank you. I'm going to combine these two questions, beginning with a specific example and then a general question. Humboldt and Sonoma counties already have their marijuana licensing policies in place. 
Once, once we get a state law giving five years to establish local growers before big corporations move, move in, yet that five years has nearly expired. And we still don't have a licensing policy and big corporations are already here. What will you do to support local growers? That's the specific question. And the general question is, what is your position on the cannabis industry in the county? So local growers and in general, the whole cannabis industry. You should address both of those. Hey, shall I start? Please. Uh, yeah, uh, my, my position is, is I am supportive of, of the local uh, cannabis industry. Uh, I think currently that we have a, a very large oversupply condition right now, uh, which has uh, made the, the value of the cannabis that's, that's being grown uh, very, very, very low. And, is, and the amount of money that's available there is not compatible with what the state of California is asking. At least last time I heard they wanted $165 a pound, something like that. I'm, I'm not actually a grower, but I, but I am a business guy. And I, and I take great offense to uh, any sort of condition that, that harms the people that are legitimately trying to uh, deal with the product legally. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of, of trying to help them out as much as I can. Uh, but as a supervisor, the best that can possibly be done is not have the county be abusive or otherwise uh, demanding money of them up front when they never got the money in the first place. And so I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. I'm, I'm very, very uh, kindly uh, when somebody comes across something like this. It would be the same thing if, uh, say, we had a lot of wheat growing and uh, there was some terrible uh, cataclysmic natural event that destroyed their crop. I'm not going to go back and chew on the guy. That's, it, it just seems a little heartless to me. Well, thank you. All right, going back to the other question, I just wanted to finish up that the program we're trying to implement is a non-lethal exclusionary wildlife services program. And if there is a problem with a skunk or rabbit animal box or whatever, and people have that concern, call animal control. We have animal control, and I was instrumental in moving animal control from the sheriff's office over to animal care. So now we'll have this program, the non-lethal exclusionary program and animal control all under the same umbrella of people who really care about animals. So um, with that, I'll go on to cannabis. And you know, this, well, I'm very proud to be endorsed by the Mendocino Cannabis Alliance and the Cobolo Cannabis Advocacy Group because they've seen that you know, I've worked very hard to support the mom and pops growers of this county. What we don't need is, and I'm proud that I was a lone vote in standing up against this expansion and the corporate takeover of Mendocino County for cannabis. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and the way that succeeded was that the people got out there and got the signatures to get the referendum and then the super other supervisors, four other supervisors then realized that maybe that wasn't the right direction, wasn't what the people of Mendocino County wanted. So, so I think that um, it, was a, it was a historic event in Mendocino County, the third time a referendum had derailed uh, an ordinance like that. And we need to do more of that. We need to keep it in the perspective of what's good for the people of Mendocino County. Thank you. Next question, what is your vision for economic development for Mendocino County? So with economic development, that it's a critical issue right now because we're seeing that at the national level, we have issues with the economy. And we're seeing it certainly you know, at the county level. And with Mendocino County, you know, when I came into office, I said there were four key issues. That one was career and technical education. Coming from an education background, you know, I believe that we need to provide this education for, 
for the people of Mendocino County, whether you're in you know, K-12 or TK-12 or, you know, an adult. You know, we need to provide that those educational opportunities. One of the things I worked with Senator McGuire on and uh, Superintendent Hutchins was that uh, we got, we worked on career and technical education throughout the county. And also we got this paramedic EMT program started at Mendocino College. The first day they had slots for 24 people. We had 36 people at the door waiting to show, you know, hoping that they could get into the program. With that, that kind of training is key for the safety of our communities, for the ambulance service and all that. But we also have issues of broadband. We have issues of water. You know, without sustainable water, we can't do community development, economic growth, because we just can't grow without the water and, um, and cannabis. You know, the cannabis has been, the economy is down, the price of cannabis is way down, but it's an instrumental um, program or economic aspect of our county. We need to support them as much as possible. The state's given us $18 million to get people to their annual licenses, and we need to make sure that those people can get their annual licenses because we all know that the car dealerships, the restaurants, the schools all depend on people, and this um, this part of our economy, the cannabis industry. So I support all of those those four main things of economic development. Uh, yeah, in terms of economic development, I, I very much would like to see things like, like the cannabis industry come back. I, I know it's very, very difficult at the moment because of an oversupply condition that they currently are suffering with. I, I think that uh, we need more businesses, kind of like Metal FX or, or uh, Factory Pipe Products in Ukiah. These are very, very good manufacturing jobs. Uh, manufacturing, uh, as, as it's something I've been in for many, many, many years, it's critically important to have that. Without that, all the other jobs that are service-based would, would suffer. Now, I don't mean to say the service jobs are not important, and, and they really are. But you cannot run your entire community off of service jobs alone because you'll, you'll end up with a condition where the money goes around in a circle and it will decline in value by the rate of inflation. Only in manufacturing, which is the, the farming, the agriculture, the machining, the, the uh, actually even a restaurant because they put food together and give you something for it. Uh, all these things are extremely important because they actually generate generate real wealth from something that was otherwise worth much much less. And so I would I would be very interested in going after that. I I, I think we have a fair amount of, of things going on in the educational part to support that, of which I'm grateful. But in the end, you need the guy that wants to. Uh, put forth his money to invest, to, to get the machinery or the equipment or whatever, whatever he needs together in order to establish something that's going to create a new product. And that will be so welcome and drive the, the economy forward. Thank you. In the April 28, 2022 issue of the Willits Weekly, there was an article article titled County Budget Woes. It states that there are currently 400 vacant positions at the county level, of which 287 are being recruited for. Do you have any thoughts on the number of having so many unfilled positions at the county level and, or any other thoughts related to this in general? Interesting. This this actually is the first I've heard of, of that particular issue. I know that uh, the economy uh, has been very difficult. Uh, I know that the uh, the sheriff's department has been actively recruiting people to fill positions at the uh, at the sheriff's department. Uh, but to, to that to that extent, uh, I I I didn't I didn't know about that. I think that. Uh, there are there are a lot of people that are that are out of work that are 
I'm certain that if they went to the county to, with the proper uh, uh, credentials could, could, could be considered for their employment. Uh, but beyond that, I, I, I'm going to have to pass on that before I look into it further. It's, I tend to look at things before I make a complete decision on it. Thank you. Yeah, the county has a lot of positions that are open and a lot of um, services that are being delayed for people because those positions aren't open. What we aren't, aren't built, I mean, you know, I'm on an ad hoc committee to hire a human resource director. This is a critical position in our county, you know, that oversees the 1,100 employees of the county, human resource director. We, uh, we looked at it, we put it out for, you know, published it with the California State Association of Counties, the, the other agencies or you know, at the state level, and we put it out to the universities, we need this human resource director. We didn't get it. We got maybe one or two replies, and then they ended up backing out. We went to, so then we went to a headhunter, and we said, we need, you know, your help, $20,000, $25,000, is what it's going to cost. And they said, we don't even want to take you on. That's, they said, we're too busy. We don't, we can't take you on. And so the issue is, We've got demographic changes in our society where a lot of people are retiring, resigning, whatever with the pandemic. We have people that haven't come back to work. We have people that have moved away from the public service um, sector. And so we need to really work to install that sense that working for the county is, is a noble endeavor and that it's, it's a good career. Um, and so that goes across you know, planning and building services. It goes through all the agencies of our county that we can't hire the people. And you know, I went to the sheriff's um, hiring fair the other night and was very impressed that there were like half a dozen people who were interested in getting jobs with it. And that's the kind of outreach we need to do. And the sheriff did it here in Willis. Next question, what can you do to address homelessness? Senator McGuire said in a recent town hall that many safety regulations have been suspended in order to build housing to address the homeless issue. Doesn't that set up tenements and slums from the outset? Yeah, I'm not aware of what Senator McGuire is talking about, but I have been working with Senator McGuire. We actually toured the home project Home Key in Ukiah, which is on Orchard Street. It used to be the Best Western. And um, he and I went and looked at what was going on there. It was a state-funded project, and the county jumped on it. And we, we approved that project in maybe six months. We had people living in the, the converted um, hotel hotel and so um, there's a lot of things we need to do for homelessness there's that project home key you know other areas of the county have issues not just Ukiah but we also need to look at what we can do for creating housing and we need to look at what our planning and building code are you know what we can do to you know the state has given us more leniency in um, allowing you know multiple houses on a, a resident a residence a land use area that's only um, able for one house but now they say well you can build an additional dwelling unit there and so we need to look at some of those ways of taking advantage of the new state laws because it's a problem throughout the state it's a problem throughout the country but in Mendocino County, where wages aren't that high, but still the cost of living and housing is very high, we need to see what we can do. I've also worked with a professor from UC Davis on you know, housing trust, 
you know, if the county can buy the land, then someone else can build it. It would take away that cost for people. And we also need to look at cooperative housing and some of those other models that would allow people to get equity into the home without having to spend $500,000. Uh, uh, yeah, the issue of homelessness, it, 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 it's near and dear to me as well. I, uh, I'm very keenly aware that uh, the reason someone is homeless is it, it varies. Uh, now, from my reading, what I'm seeing is about roughly three quarters of the people that are homeless. It's because of uh, alcoholism or drug abuse uh, and some amount of mental illness that actually harkens back to the uh, whatever their addicted uh, their addiction is from. Uh, for those people, this is a very 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 difficult thing to do because now it is no longer a housing problem. Because if if they could function normally, it it, it would rectify itself fairly quickly. But for them, it comes down to where they're going to have to be in some ways uh, going through some type of program or something where they are no longer going to be uh, strung out on whatever their drug of choice is. Now this is also very important because they also can't necessarily be around the rest of the public because they have a long-standing history of, of this when this there's this behavior going on of breaking into other people's houses and cars to steal stuff to get their next fix. That's most of it. But as I've said before, the other part of it, where it is a housing problem, I think there's something that can be done here. And having uh, a, a affordable housing built, that's, that's a whole lot uh, easier to work with. I'm talking about relatively smaller types of places where they can, they can move into and inhabit fairly quickly. And, and I think this is something that, that can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Um, what are your thoughts on a CEO versus CAO position? So CEO, the chief executive officer in the county, top position. Um, I believe that was put in place in the 90s. The, the top position used to be CAO, chief administrative official position. And there's different ways of running the county based on how that, what that position is, whether it's CEO versus CAO. So what are your thoughts on having it as a CEO position or CAO position? Okay. Uh, yeah, I thought the, the CEO position was a little troubling in that it made uh, uh, certain aspects Actually, significant aspects of the of the uh, the county, uh, not under the guise of the supervisors. I think the supervisors are the final word, and and they should be. They're they're elected. It's it's an important uh, thing to where if there's any sort of problem going on in the county, it ultimately would come come to the to, to the understanding of the supervisors. But uh, to my knowledge, uh, I've got the the uh, breakdown of the organizational chart here in front of me. Uh, the uh, Board of Supervisors, they're the people that would uh, would appoint the County Council, the Child Support Services, the Public Defender, and the as well as Probation, Air Quality Management, Farm Advisor, and Water Agency, which is as it should be. However, the uh, Chief Executive Officer was appointing the person that would head up Health and Human Services, the Behavioral, behavioral Health, the Public Health, uh, the Social Services, I see a, a position here for transportation, human resources, and such. Uh, there's a certain point there where some of these people uh, that are appointed there by, 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 the, by the CEO, it, it, it does create a problem. I would really, really much rather see a CAO, which is the uh, county administrative officer that would answer to uh, the supervisors rather than the supervisors knuckling under to the CEO. So that's that's my that's my best bet. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, this was a hot topic when, when I was elected. And and the the issue was did the CEO model that we have currently and, and have had for the last 12 years or so, was it giving too much power to the CEO? And and that's a question that um, still is being dealt with. We right now the CEO you know retired in March, and we have an interim CEO for the next year until we can figure out what we want to do. There was a proposal brought back from the ad hoc committee working on this issue, and they brought back that we should keep the CEO model, but also interview the department heads once a year. I didn't think that that looked at the big picture enough, and that we need to look at the org chart, we need to look at you know what other departments would be better served by having direct oversight from the board. We took on the cannabis department, we put it under the board's purview and directly under the oversight of the board. I don't know how well that has worked. Uh, we also have, but we have other departments that might be better off underneath the, the board, such as the general services <coughs> department, the um, clerk of the board, and also human resources. Those are critical departments for how the county runs. So maybe it could be a hybrid where we do have a CEO where one person's responsible for how the county does business, but for some of these areas that the board would be having direct oversight. Because I think that if you give it all to the CEO, then things sometimes, and right now I feel like we have a, um, a good person in in the CEO position, but sometimes things can get a little, um, you know, tilted. And we had the, we had issues in the third district where we didn't have really good representation for a while, and so people felt like the CEO took over too much power, and it was because um, because we didn't have the re strong representation. But I feel like in the last year, well, since I've been on the board. I think it's tilted back the other way where the board has taken back power and um, we are working together, we're stronger, and uh, I think we're better represented. The people are better represented because of it. Would you support funding should Mendocino County experience an increase in the need for women's health care services? Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. For 500000 <laughs> Would you support funding should Mendocino County experience an increase in the need for women's health care services? Yes, I think that one of the things that we need to do as a county is provide for the health of all of our people. One of the, and so, if we could get funding for better health care for women's issues, then let's do it. One of the things that I've been working on, and I'm, I've been working for the last six months with a group of really dedicated people who represent the community, the rural health centers, the first five, the Adventist system, um, and others were trying to create a community health worker program. And what we did in Willits with the pandemic was we started the Nuestra Alianza and the Promotores de Salud program underneath Nuestra Alianza. That provided this direct outreach to people to get them the information about the pandemic, to get them um, educated about how to stay safe, and then also to get vaccinated. Okay, that was a very successful program. The, the community health worker program I've been working on with this group of dedicated people is kind of trying to expand that pilot program from Willits to the county. And if we can expand the outreach of these kind of programs where people go into communities that are normally resistant or underrepresented or not really um, 
totally taken care of, you know, disparate incomes and um, disparate health, health, um, um, anyway, they're, they're not getting the treatment they need. And so that's what the Nuestra Alianza program did, and we're trying to do it overall. If it's women's issues, then yes, I certainly support that uh, increase in getting that resource to them too. No, no, and, and I'll tell you why. Uh, th this, this comes under the heading of the government should only do those things for the people that the people simply could not do for themselves. And I think that this is an area where the people can do it for themselves. This is not a, not a, a very difficult thing. Now, I can understand that people have to have uh, easy, easy access to medical facilities for their health care. And this matters not whether they're a man, woman, or child. And I would never differentiate between any of those, as I, I think it would be perhaps inappropriate to do so. I, I really think that it's uh, this is an area where I think that the people absolutely are capable of doing this themselves. And anytime you have a, a request of this nature, I, I would probably not, not support it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This question, as a supervisor, will you enforce state laws even though you may or may not agree with them? Why or why not? Okay, uh, if, if there's state laws that I disagree with, ultimately when it comes down to it, I would really much rather be representing and looking out for the best interests of the people that I represent over some meddlesome, meddlesome state agency. I'm here to represent you. And I'm certainly not going to, to be put upon by, by any, any agency, whether it's state or federal. Now, I may not have a choice in the matter. Maybe they, they've got something over my head that's going to crush me as, as surely as a rock hitting me in the head. But ultimately, when it comes right down to it, I'm still a citizen of this county, of this state, of the United States. And I will pen a letter that will be in the best interest of the people, that they are not put upon by a, a, a law that I find to be harmful or detrimental to you. Thank you. Well, that was a, a, a good point. And the question is, would we, uh, would we abide by the state law? You know, I'm very proud to be endorsed by Senator McGuire, Assembly Member Wood, and our you know, local and state representatives. And if we have a law or a proposed bill that is detrimental to Mendocino County, we need to be working with our state agencies. You know, I'm the county representative for the California State Association of Counties. That's where we get our input and say, this does not work for the county. We've had to do that many, many times, and that's how legislation gets built. You know, also, the um, RCRC, which represents the rural counties of the Cal uh, California. So through that process, we hope to, to get laws that serve Mendocino County. I mean, if, certainly if a law is passed, we have to abide by it because it's a state law. But the process is we try to uh, you know, amend it, make it so it serves our needs way beforehand. We have a legislative platform in the county that we're always adjusting and depending on the circumstances of the county. You know, right now we just had the state budget come out and there were some things such as the elimination of the cannabis cultivation tax, which the county of Mendocino had um, promoted and lobbied for. Okay, and so Senator McGuire, I've worked closely with him about this SB 1074, which kind of did a lot of the same thing about getting rid of this cultivation tax. So that's how the process works and what we're, so I'm very proud to be endorsed by those people because it's a collaborative effort at this level of governance, you know, making things work, hearing what the people say, 
taking it to our state representatives and back and forth until we get something that we can live with. Next question, what is your position on enforcing Measure B, leaving intentionally killed trees standing? Measure B. Yeah, Measure B is the Hackensworth issue. The county passed it, and I was on an ad hoc to work on how to, what to do with it, because for a while, before I was elected, the county would not pursue it, okay? With the ad hoc that I was on, we met with representatives from the environmental community, we met with representatives from the big timber companies too, and we were trying to work out a way of moving forward with it. You know, my commitment at the time was to make sure, well, we were waiting on an opinion from the state attorney general, and we weren't getting it. So I said I was going to push for that, and when Supervisor Williams and I were in Sacramento, we hand-delivered the letter from Mendocino County requesting an opinion from the Attorney General. Shortly after that, the Attorney General's office said, we have a conflict of interest. We can't opine on this, this issue. And so it was really up to the county to decide, what are you going to do? Are you going to enter into a, a lawsuit against MRC and the big timber companies that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, or are you going to respect the will of the people and enforce this uh, measure B? The, the, the issue was the hack and squirt, but the measure was written so it just created nuisance. It allowed the county to declare a nuisance of dead standing trees. So it wasn't going to eliminate the issue of squirting pesticides in our forest. And that's what I think most people wanted. And it's very difficult. So I guess the bottom line is that the issue became more convoluted the more I got into it. And I wish that I had a really clear answer to it, but um, I don't at this point. Anyway. Yeah, on, on, on this, uh, and you said it was Major B? E. B. 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 As in victory. Oh, victory Trump. Okay. The, uh, I, I, I find it rather troubling why, why, why they would use a hack and squirt method here. Is, is there something about these trees that are, that are so valueless that, that you just might as well just destroy them? I, I, I don't understand that. I would think that these, these trees could be used for a lot of other things. So, how, how this came about or why they were doing this and, and the, the various considerations that the timber companies have, I would be really interested to hear because I want to see everything get used in the best possible, most efficient way and not just simply uh, poisoned and des destroyed. So uh, the other thing I would like to know is when they say hack and squirt, I need to know what kind of poison they're using. What, what What's going on here? Is this... Is this something that's, that's extremely harmful, or is it kind of like Agent Orange from Madagascar? Well, if they're using Agent Orange, that's a big problem. So, uh, so I, I, I would, I would, I would want to to uh, certainly look into this a little bit more than that, and uh, and I can, and I certainly, well, as much as I appreciate, like we were talking about going and uh, working at the uh, or talking and getting an opinion from uh, from the state, I, I can well understand there's a certain point where you just have to say that's it, we're going to do this, and and that's just part of being a leader, and you you have to go ahead with with what you need to do rather than wait. Time is money. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to ask two more questions while running out of time. So, um, first one, what experience do you have managing a multi-million dollar budget? What, what experience so, do you have managing a multi-million dollar budget? Oh, I have no experience. I've never dealt with a multi-million dollar budget. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well, going back to my years in education, I was very involved in the California Teachers Association and at all levels. I, I was involved at the state level and I was on the budget committee for California Teachers Association, CTA. Um, Val was also on that committee at one point. I think I took her seat from her. Uh, and I ended up being the, the chair of the budget committee for seven years. It's the longest uh, chairmanship in the history of CTA, 150-year um, history. And so we had a over $300 million budget and um, we balanced it every year and we also had healthy, healthy reserves because uh, with that kind of budget is very tricky. Now I'm dealing with the county budget, which is also around $300 million. Um, only about 70 million of that is discretionary. And I feel like uh, we could use a lot more discretionary funds because it, it really ties the hands of what the supervisors can do, even with best intentions. And so that's kind of my experience with, with budgets, you know, the California Teachers Association and now currently with uh, the county. And the last question before you close the statement, how would you move the county to be part of climate solutions? Yeah, great question. Thanks for ending it on that. I think that the, you know, we have climate change with us, and we're living in this age that if we don't do anything, we are all going to perish from it. And so we're, we're feeling the effects every day with our forest fires, um, with drought, all those issues. So I'm very proud that the Board of Supervisors has been unanimous in moving certain things forward. We put $2 million into solar um, panels and funding. We were, were moving on electric vehicle chargers. I'm on MCOG, which is the Mendocino Council of Governments, and very much pushing for electric vehicle charger stations throughout the county because that's the future we're going towards. Um, and I, I've also been working with Supervisor Jurdy on this renewable energy network, and that would provide rebates for people with for energy efficient appliances. So if you wanted to buy a new stove that's energy efficient or um, heat pumps or whatever it is, then this would provide great rebates through the California the CPUC which is the Utilities Corporation or whatever for the state of California. So those are issues, you know, and I think that also we started the um, Mendocino County Climate Action Advisory Council, and that group has been working diligently on create, uh, providing uh, advice to the board on how to make the county greener, and more sustainable and to deal with climate action issues. And so those are all issues, you know, I think that the board has done a lot of things in the last four years to combat climate change and to make this a better world for all of us in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm certainly well aware of, of the, the reports I've heard uh, I'm, uh, I'm certainly very mindful of the environment. I don't want to see things be destroyed. I, I want to see if we can preserve things as much as I can. But I'm also aware that as late as 1985, it was well understood that we were going into a global cooling. Now, just you know, that far ago is, is not that far. Usually when we're dealing with something that's catastrophic, as, as they were talking about, which was formerly called global warming, it's now called global climate change, it has not in fact shifted. This is what I'm finding. I think it's probably ill-conceived, I think it's a, a mistake to be addressing something like this and, and, and identifying money to be spent on something that ultimately will, would, would uh, lead to no fruition at all. I, I think that it's 
it's something where we really need to take a good, hard, long look at ourselves here. Because when you're talking about the globe, what about the in incredible environmental damage that's going on in China? They don't seem to be even remotely concerned with what we're calling climate change. And you'll find this in many other parts of the world too. And, and, and the other part of it is, as far as uh, you know, man-made global climate change, you think if we could actually change the climate significantly enough, we could use that to our advantage to increase, uh, uh, say, growing seasons or something like this? Well, it hasn't happened. And we're, and we're operating on mostly based off of computer models, which as you all know, if you don't get the information right, well, we can't expect the information good to come out. Thank you. So we are at the point of closing statements. And I, John, you did the opening statement first, yes? Who did? Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So, Mr. Romero, would you provide us with your closing statement first? Um, yeah, but let's see what I can come up with. Something entertaining and fun. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm thinking it was probably a very good thing that I went and actually filed. Otherwise, we'd have a really boring election. Yeah. And for that reason, I, I, I'm I think that was probably a good thing to do. Uh, I would like to see how this is going to turn out. I, uh, I think I think I have uh, views that are, that are different to John's here, but I think we're also generally respect, respectful of others, and we want to do our, our very best in ensuring that although we have political views that are differing, in the end, we are all people. I don't hate this man over here or this woman over here. I think about you too, and I care about you very much. I know that there's different ways how we view the world and how we view our, our what we do. But in the end, and I think I, I summed this up in, in a statement on dealing with the cannabis industry. We can take this whole 42 page document here it's at uh, 10A.17. Ooh, I got it right that time. 10A.17. <laughs> and if we were to sum that up in one, in one simple phrase, it is, when you grow cannabis, don't irritate your neighbor. You know, it, 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 there's a certain point where we need to kind of simplify things and just make it easier so as people don't need an attorney to figure out what they're going to do next. I don't think that's asking for too much. Well, anyway, I do appreciate it. And I, and I hope you vote for me. It'll be coming up on, on uh, at least the final day is on June 7th. And you can uh, see my uh, my website at uh, clay, clay for Mendocino org. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming out this afternoon and spending this beautiful spring day in, a, in the Grange um, and listening to superintendent candidates and also the candidates for third district supervisor. You know, I want to thank the uh, Mendocino Women's Political Coalition, the WELL, uh, the Grange, the League of Women Voters, and uh, and uh, everyone who helped put this on, because this is what democracy is about. You know, I appreciate um, having this chance to talk with everyone. Um, we, you know, when I came into office, there were these three issues, good governance, the economy, and safer communities. And I think that I've worked really hard on all three of those things throughout the last three and a half years. And I've been endorsed by Sheriff Kendall. I've been endorsed by former Sheriff Tom Allman. I've been endorsed by Ellen and David Drell, the Mendocino um, um, Cannabis Alliance. You know, I've been endorsed by um, State Senator McGuire, Assemblymember Wood. You know, 
people, okay, and the Brook Trails board was unanimous in their support of me. Um, the three out of the five members of the Willis City Council, you know, the chair of the Round Valley Area MAC, the Municipal Advisory Council, endorsing me. The chair of the Cabo Tribe in Laytonville, the chair of the Long Valley or Long Valley or Laytonville Area MAC. You know, so I've got this over 150 endorsements. And I, I appreciate that because it's recognition of the work that we're all doing together. When we work together, we can get things done, whether it's creating these um, emergency access routes or, or more trust in government and greater communication. It's all about you know, what I've seen in the last four years is people working together. And so thank you, John Haschak, third district supervisor. Um, I ask for your vote. So I want to thank both candidates for being here today on this lovely day. Um, we really appreciate you coming to be with us. Um, and everyone else who showed up, uh, thank you for your questions. And don't forget to vote. Don't forget to sign the library petition. Um, and I'm Thank you. Thank you.